Cool. Okay, so my name's Claire and I'll be talking to you today about upside down jellyfish in Lake Macquarie. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm on, which is the Gamagal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So jellyfish blooms are increasing on a global scale. It's believed that they're increasing due to in increased favorable conditions as a result of human modifications to, co to um, coastal environments. So this includes increased man-made structures, climate change causing increase uh, eutrophication temperatures as well as changes to salinity and fisheries depleting predators and competitors. So jellyfish are expanding their range through both natural means as well as anthropogenic means, including shipping traffic, ballast water and release through the aquarium trade. So my focal species is the upside down jellyfish, also known as Cassiopeia, which is their genus name. And they're kind of like the lazy jellyfish of the sea. So they spend most of their life upside down with their bell resting on the sediment and their oral arms extended above them. They do this because they have photosynthetic algae called zooxanthellae in the tissue of their oral arms. And so this position exposes that algae to sunlight, providing them with up to 90% of their nutritional needs, with the other 10% coming from filter feeding. And as you can see in this photo down here, they can swim when they're so required to do so. So upside down jellyfish typically occur in tropical to subtropical regions in very sheltered enclosed habitats. So mangrove forests, um, seagrass beds or coral reefs. And they're considered to be globally invasive with a number of expansion records occurring all around the world. So this has included Brazil, Hawaii, Vietnam, and even Australia. And they're considered to be successful invaders because they have high reproductive rates and they're able to reproduce both sexually and asexually. So this is a photo of one of their invasion events in Brazil. And as you can see, they just lie in this beach. And densities have recorded these jellyfish up to 168 individuals per meter square. Now these jellyfish can be the size of a dinner plate. So you can just imagine the ecological impact that this can have. So they are considered to be ecosystem engineers, either through direct impacts, such as predation or indirect impacts, such as competition. Additionally, these jellyfish will release their stinging cells into the water column, creating a sensation that scientists have appropriately named as stingy water. And this can cause local fish to leave the area due to discomfort. So within Australia, as you can see from this map, the jellyfish typically have a more northern tropical distribution. There's one population in South Australia that's been there for over 20 years by one of the power plant outlets. The water's a lot warmer. But my main interest is these three red dots, and that's because they occur in temperate New South Wales. So the jellyfish were first reported in Lake Illawarra in 2013 and then Wallace Lake in 2014. So a study done at the Australian Museum looked at the morphology of these two populations and concluded that two species were occurring. They ID'd the Wallace Lake specimens as Cassiopeia merometans, and then the Lake Illawarra specimens as Cassiopeia nidrosia. And then in 2017, a member of the public recorded that the jellyfish were in Lake Macquarie. So this raised the question of which species was occurring, where had it come from, and what was the population dynamics like of this typically tropical genus in a temperate environment? So that led to my PhD, which has three main aims. Firstly, to identify the species that's occurring. Secondly, to understand the distribution and seasonality of the jellyfish within Lake Macquarie. And thirdly, to understand the environmental drivers causing their numbers to fluctuate and driving their invasion. But today I'll just talk to you about the first aim, which is identifying the species. And this actually proved quite difficult. So worldwide, there are nine species recognized, four of those in Australia, but Cassiopeia is considered to be a cryptic genus. So they're really difficult to distinguish based on morphological characters alone. So I had to combine genetics with morphology. So for the genetics, I collected tissues from two parts of the jellyfish, the tip of the oral arm and the gonads. And the reason we did two parts of the jellyfish is because we found it really hard to extract DNA from these guys. And we think that's because they're really mucousy. Um, so this is a fun little video of me extracting the gonads from the jellyfish. So you can see they kind of just slide on out of the subgenital pit and then we put it in 95% ethanol. And we compared the sequences using the CO1 barcoding gene. 
And these were our results within Australia. So really cool, we found the Lake Macquarie specimens came out as the same species as in Wallace Lake and Pelican waters in Queensland. Now Pelican waters is the type locality for Cassiopeia merometans, so we're able to conclude that this was the species occurring. Now really interestingly, we found the Lake Illawarra specimens were the same species as another uh, population in Moreton Bay at Coomaba Creek. So we're able to confirm that there's actually two species that are moving down the east coast of Australia. Genetics showed that we also have another species occurring at Lizard Island, and then Cassiopeia Andromeda was in South Australia. So from here, we wanted to see how these populations sat um, with other sequences worldwide. So I compared these sequences to everything I could get off GenBank, and it created this big complicated looking tree. But I'm just gonna focus on this section here because this is where the Lake Macquarie specimens came out. So really interestingly, they came out as the same species occurring in Hawaii, Brazil, Panama, and the Florida Keys. And this has already been identified as Cassiopeia zamacana. Additionally, we found the South Australian population came out as the same species as in Brazil, Mexico, French Polynesia, Egypt, Israel, Bermuda, Hawaii, and the Florida Keys. So you can see how dispersed just one species of this jellyfish can be. So there are a couple of conclusions that we could make from this. Firstly, the Lake Macquarie species is actually Cassiopeia zamacana. Secondly, the Cassiopeia merometans is a junior synonym of Cassiopeia zamacana, as this is the older name of the two. Something else I'd like to point out here is how closely related these two species are. So it's believed that Zamakana is a recent divergence from Andromeda. Morphologically, the two species are basically identical. So locality is mainly used to identify these two species. So the next section I'd like to focus on is this green box down here, because this is where the Lake Illawarra species came out. So it came out very closely related to a species in Papua New Guinea, Hawaii, and Japan. Um, there's still quite a few names that are floating around that haven't been assigned to sequences yet. So for the rest of this talk, I'll just refer to it as Cassiopeia spur. So as I've mentioned, we've managed to confirm that two species are moving down the east coast of Australia. So we wanted to understand if there are any morphological characters that distinguish these two species. So in order to do that, I looked at specimens from all those localities that I had genetic samples from, and there are a number of features that I examined. So firstly, I looked at the lappet shape. These are the little grooves occurring around the bell margin of the jellyfish. I looked at the oral arm length and branching pattern. So this is the oral arm down here, and you can see it's got the little branches coming off it, kind of like a tree. And then finally, I looked at the large appendages. So the large appendages are these leaf-like structures here, and they have two main purposes. Firstly, they provide extra surface area for the zooxanthellae. And secondly, they contain casosomes, which are basically nested structures containing the stinging cells of the jellyfish. And once I'd taken the measurements, we followed it with our Permanova, NMDS, and Simpa. And these were the results. So really cool, we got a significant Permanova uh, with the different species. So you can see there's really clear clustering between Zamacana compared to Cassiopeia spur. And then I have another species from Papua New Guinea in green. Something I'd like to point out with in blue here is these blue dots here. So that's from the type locality of Cassiopeia merometans. So you can see how nicely uh, the morphological features sit in there. Um, so the features that were driving the sim uh, these differences between species includes the location of the largest appendage, the number of central appendages, and the length of the large appendage on the oral arm. So those are those leaf-like structures. Additionally, the oral arm branching pattern and the location of the fourth in the oral arm and the lappet shape. And I'll just show you some of those differences now. So you can see here the lappets of the jellyfish from Lake Macquarie were very rounded and connected. That was the same for Pelican Waters compared to Goombaba Creek where you had notches occurring between the lappets and they were much more straight. We then look at the oral arm branching pattern. In Lake Macquarie, the arms alternated and then at the fork in the end, one side of the fork was much stronger than the other. This was the same with pelican waters, where again, the lateral branches were alternating, and then one side of the fork was much stronger than the other, compared to Coombaba Creek, which was a combination of alternating and pinate, so in line with each other. And then the fork at the end of the oral arm was equal in strength. 
Finally, the large appendages. In Lake Macquarie, you had a large appendage on the fork of the oral arm. This was the same with Pelican Waters, where it was absent from Coomba Creek as most of the large appendages occurred in the central oral disc. And if they were on the arm, they were much smaller. So from this, we're able to conclude that Cassiopeia zamacana is occurring in Lake Macquarie, Cassiopeia marimetans is a junior synonym of Cassiopeia zamacana, and that two species appear to be moving down the east coast of Australia, and we pointed out the morphological differences between those two species. From here, I'd like to combine these results with three years worth of fieldwork to understand the population dynamics of this tropical species in a temperate environment, as well as what's driving their invasion down the east coast of Australia. The final thing I'd like to do is assign a name to the populations that are to the species that's occurring in Coomba Creek and Lake Illawarra. But that's probably going to be post PhD. Thank you for listening to my talk today. And I'd like to thank all my supervisors and please let me know if you have any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Claire. And um, that was a great talk. I knew nothing about jellyfish before, so <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, does anyone have any questions for Claire? I was curious with how um, you're saying the locality is kind of the easiest way to identify the species sometimes. Yeah. Do you think with the way they're moving around, you're going to end up having multiple species existing in the same location, in which case it's yeah. going to start making identifying these things really tricky? Absolutely. I mean, that's already happened in the Florida Keys. So both those species that are morphologically the same, they both occur in the Florida Keys. So really to identify them, you need to do genetics. And that's already happening in Australia. So both species, um, the unnamed one, as well as Cassiopeia zamacana, they're both occurring in Moreton Bay in the Gold Coast. At the moment, the populations are still separate, but they're in within 200 metres of each other because these jellyfish will cluster in one very dense clump and then there'll be a massive gap and then there'll be another clump. Um, so they are occurring in the same environments and very close to each other, but their clumps uh, within, it, like, it's still one species within each clump of jellyfish at the moment. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, there's one from Michelle. Is there an impact of aggregating predators when the jellyfish die? Uh, yeah, so there's been some studies at the moment looking at the effects on the benthic community, especially um, because when they die, a lot of oxygen is kind of sucked out of the water column. Um, on With predators, uh, these jellyfish don't have many predators. There's a couple of uh, marine worms that will eat them, a couple of polychaetes. Um, but that they're kind of the only things that have been recorded eating these jellyfish. Um, yeah, so not, not yet. <laughs> um, there's another one from Steve Cooper who says, I may have missed it, uh, but where did the Adelaide species come from? That's a really interesting question, especially as that same species is occurring through Israel, Egypt, Hawaii, all over the place. It's most likely through shipping traffic um, maybe or the bottom of a boat, stuff like that. That seems to be the main way that jellyfish are being dispersed around the world. Thanks, Claire. 